Hi there and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Dre Renee Knits and I am going to answer some of your questions and today we have a pretty fun mix of questions and before we get started I did just want to do a little um I wanted to say PDA but that's not right. Let's try PSA? Public service announcement? Yep, PSA. Um, I did see some specific pattern questions in there and due to the volume of questions I get and everything like that, I just wanted to put a little note here to say that if you go to the last page on your pattern, you will actually see a little note with the email address that you can email for your specific um, pattern of mine that you're working on. So if you're ever stuck and you need some help, just flip to that last page um, and we are available to help answer some of those specific pattern questions Monday through Friday. So make sure to use that if you're just stuck and need a little guidance. I am wearing the Daydreamer. This is a sweater that I knit up in Sue Copy and Mighty Mo, which are both from the Farmer's Daughter Fibers, and actually kind of a different color palette for me, which I didn't think about till just now. I don't generally knit in kind of like a cream color, um, but I, I really like it. So it has some fun cables, texture, bobbles, some of my favorite things. And sometimes I even wear it backwards with this side forward. Um, I don't tend to wear low cut necklines at all, but I do love the V neck on this when I layer it over something else. Um, so yeah, it is called the Daydreamer and I highly recommend all of the Farmer's Daughter Fibers yarns because they're beautiful and I especially love Sukapi. So you should check it out. I will of course link to the pattern below and let's get into some of these questions. So question number one, joining that first round. I am new to knitting in the round. After a break from knitting of more than 20 years, I made socks and hats and mount my first top down sweater. Try double um, DPNs, double point needles, small circulars and no magic loop. It's all going well, muscle memory has returned in full, but my tiny annoying problem is the spot where the first cast on stitch is knit to create the round. That join is hit and miss and a bit gappy sometimes. Do I just continue to sew it up while weaving in ends, um, which is their current fix? It works, but isn't satisfying as I feel there must be some magic. Grab the stitch next to it and knit together through the back loop kind of trick that super knitters know. Perhaps a video tutorial that I'm yet to find. They're so wonderfully helpful. So I will say yes. One thing you can absolutely do is cast on one extra stitch and when you join in the round, knit the last stitch of the round and the first stitch of the round together. So you would slip the last stitch of the round over and then knit it with the first stitch. I don't do that probably because I'm too lazy to ever think about it. <laughs> um, you know, I just don't I, don't, I don't mind the little gap though. So I absolutely just sew that closed. I guess that's why I don't mind the gap because I do sew it closed with the tail. You, you're always going to have a tail of yarn there that needs to be woven in. So why not just use that to doot doot? And I think it closes it up rather seamlessly. Like I can't generally tell my beginning of round. I'm trying to see it on here. Wow, I actually trimmed my ends on this one. That's new for me. Um, like I cannot find my beginning of round on this hat. And that's what I did. You know, I just um, closed it up. But I saw this so beautifully done by Coco Knits on their Instagram. They did a little video the other day that was just brilliant, concise, and I think it might change how you feel about that little gap. So I am gonna throw a link to that below. I hope it works. I never know how well linking to like a specific Instagram post works, <laughs> um, but I am gonna throw that link below. If for some reason it doesn't work, just go on over, if you're, hopefully you're on Instagram, um, to Coco Knits, which is just C-O-C-O -C -O Knits. And yeah, this little tutorial on closing that up, I think, 
really sums it up perfectly. Next question. There are so many great patterns out there that I want to knit. I am an English style knitter and I have heard that continental knitting can be a little faster, but part of my love of knitting is the motion of English knitting. My grandmother crocheted and always wanted to learn to knit because she loved the motion of knitting. So we were signed up to take a class together to learn and she passed away. I'm so sorry for your loss. So while I'm open to continental, I know my heart is with English. Do you have any tips to increase speed with my English style knitting? So I do. Um, my grandma also taught me English style knitting and it will always hold a special place in my heart. And sometimes I still do English style knitting. And I will say I was faster as an English knitter for years. I could not have that speed continental because my muscle memory was just so good with English and I think some of the things that helped increase my speed personally and if anyone else has tips on this uh quick side note I'm pretty sure last I knew the fastest knitter in the world is an English knitter correct me if I'm wrong but I do remember that being a thing so um what I think really, really helps is not being hyper-focused on your knitting. I think that when we're just sitting quietly, like just looking at our knitting and knitting, we can be a little distractible and just a little too focused on that. So I think having something else going on, whether it be watching a film or listening to a book or reading, I used to read, um, it lets your hands do the work and you kind of forget about it. And I think that that helps increase speed because you're not overthinking it. Um, and you start to trust your muscle memory. And I think the stronger that muscle memory gets, the faster you get because you just, your hands know what they're doing. So um, I guess that's really my only tip is just maybe try distracting the eyes um, while knitting and letting your hands do what they know how to do. So that would be my recommendation. All right. I have heard you talk about buying the yarn and using it for inspiration for your patterns at times, but I think I'm getting into my head too much and not veering away from the yarns suggested in the patterns. I will find yarn I love and want to make a shawl or sweater, but either do not have enough or it is not the right weight. My latest is Magpie Fibers Nest Worsted and would love to do a cardigan since it is a marled, but the worsted cardigans in your designs have color work. Do you think it would be okay to use the pattern but just remove the color work? Thoughts? I love your patterns and learn new techniques every time I knit one of your designs. Yay! I know that as knitters we can do a lot with patterns, but I would not want to feel like I am not being respectful to one of your patterns that you work so hard on. Does that make sense? That's so thoughtful of you. Um, but I will say you have my complete permission to take that pattern, use it as a base and run wild with it. Let it be your foundation. If you want to remove the color work, by all means. I've actually stumbled across a number of knitters, knitters, through the years who took some of my designs that had something else going on in it, color work, texture, whatever it was, and took it down to what I would call like a vanilla recipe, like a basic, took out the flair, and they're beautiful and worked out great. So it is your knitting. You 100% can do with it what feels best for you and what will fill that gap in your wardrobe the best. Like absolutely make it yours. Uh, I will also say though, just to put another little idea in your head is with that marled nest for magpie, which is so beautiful. I love their marls. Um, when I did, it would have been the spark and spice cardigans for the Rhinebeck that never was, uh, right in the beginning of the pandemic. So what was that? 2020? Does anyone else feel like the past three years are a blur and I can't distinguish time because they all were just the same for a long time? Uh, I think it was 2020. Um, those sweaters, so that's always a collaboration between myself, Magpie Fibers, and Spin Cycle. And Rachel from Spin Cycle used the marled in her cardigan and so she still did the color work, but with that marled as the main color and it is so beautiful. The second I saw it, I was like, why didn't I think of that? Uh, so anyways, I recommend checking that out. If you go to 
the spin cycle Instagram and do kind of a deep dive, you could find some photos or they might have it posted on their Ravelry page. They are usually pretty good about posting their projects over there. Um, so that might be an option as well, but I know it's on their Instagram. Um, so anyways, just to throw a little bug in your ear, but I also wanted to touch on buying yarn and not really knowing how much to buy and like you fall in love with yarn and so you buy some, but you don't have a project in mind and then you get home and it never seems to be the right amount or the right way. I have absolutely been there and it's actually a question I get a lot. So I just wanted to retouch on that. Um, so one of the things I do really love is the StashBot app. I'm pretty sure it's still available. Um, I know it's available for iPhone. I don't know if they ever made it for Android. I think so but don't quote me on that. I'll link it below. Um, I need to write myself a note so I don't forget that one. Oh wait, this is a Mother's Day card. I probably shouldn't write on this, right on the back of it. Okay, uh, so I love that because you could put in, you know, you could grab your yarn and say, okay, I really love these three and, or these colors, but let's just do one. I really love this color. And let's see, it's a sock weight. I could buy one, I could do socks, or I could do a hat. So that would be a great way to buy one skein. This has 467 yards. That is a good amount of yardage. So safe, I'm gonna buy, I like knitting socks. I like knitting hats and mittens. And this would cover the base for any of those projects. So I'm comfortable buying one. But then I'm like, oh, but I love it so much. I want to make sure I have enough for a shawl. So, or I want to make sure I have enough for a sweater. So that's when I would pull out that stash bot app and be like, okay, this is a fingering weight yarn. Um, and then you can put in some rough measurements. If I remember correctly, it's too bad I'm recording this on my phone because I can't open the app and look <laughs> to jog my memory. It's been a little while since I've used it and been in a place to buy yarn. Uh, but, I would always put in there like, so for a sweater, because I design, I tend to be like, well, I want to have enough to keep my options really wide open. So I would add some positive ease to my bust and then I would always go for the tunic length sweater option in the app. And that would give me a rough estimate of about the yardage I would need for a sweater like that. Um, it's also helpful if you know roughly the gauge that you would generally knit that weight of yarn at if I remember correctly so let's say for that I would even maybe go to I mean what I would personally do is I would go to my patterns and I would be like okay what do I usually knit a worsted weight at and I would go and be like oh okay five stitches per inch and that and then so I would just do a rough gauge again these are just guesstimations but I feel like it gives you that place to start um and then from there too, for me, I don't actually feel like I have to use the app as much because I've kind of learned like, okay, I generally know that if I'm buying fingering weight yarn and I want to do a sweater, I can get between 12 and 1600 yards and I'm going to have plenty for a sweater that I would typically knit. Um, just uh, That just comes with experience. So, um, but I think that that app is a helpful way to get you there. So anyways, I'll put that down below too, but I hope that helps. Um, and yeah, one run wild with the patterns. You do you, you make what you love, what makes you feel joyful. And if it's taking that color work out of that pattern, don't think twice about it. All right, I listened for the knitting questions, but you have inspired me to start sewing again. I love the choices you've made, especially with your hand knits. I've noticed that a lot of patterns are now digital. Can you recommend a site or tutorial on how to print at home? Do you print your own sewing patterns? What kind of sewing machine do you use? I think I might need a new one. Also, any recommendations on where to buy fabric? So um, every single digital sewing pattern will actually come with instructions on exactly how to print it at home. Um, so they're included. They'll tell you exactly how to make sure that your printer is printing those pieces at the right size and all of that. I do sometimes print at home. Um, it's not my preferred method because I knit the same, 
<laughs> can you tell what I default to? I sew the same patterns a lot of the time. And so I like to store my paper patterns. I just roll them up and I have a, a thing. <laughs> It's like a cloth square basket uh, that I just have them all standing up in. And I like to be able to pull those out if I want to do a different size or anything like that. So that's why I like to keep them. And when I have put them together at home, you basically have all these pieces of paper that you've had to tape together. Um, and they don't roll up and store very easily. So I feel like they kind of break down over time. So my preference is to use... Um, there's a lot of online printers for sewing patterns now, and they're usually pretty reasonably priced. Um, I tend to use, oh man, what is it called? I am going to forget the name of it now. Oh, the receipt always says Keith Farby. I feel like there's someone out there shouting, it's called this. <laughs> I can't remember it. I will, and I will add it here. Um, write myself one more little note, digital printing. So I really like, they're the main ones I use, but you can also do U Fiber. Um, they are one of my favorite sources for buying fabric, which a lot of people have been asking me about. So I had a ton of questions about sewing. So that is why I was like, okay, I'm just going to answer one that asked a lot of questions and hope that covers quite a few of y'all's. But, um, you fibers is one of my favorite places to buy. I'm going to forget all these links, um, to buy fabric. And I also love that they do these get the look kits where like, that's how I sewed up the Arthur pants is they, put everything you need in the kit, except for the pattern. You do have to buy the pattern, but they will print it for you. So they'll do those big copy shop um, prints for you. So it basically comes on a big old piece of paper or a couple pieces for you to do. So U-Fibers is great. And then I also know um, Blackbird Fabrics, I'm pretty sure also does online um, pattern printing for sewing patterns. And I'm sure there's more. Um, really bothers me. I can't remember that one. Uh, so anyways, that's always an option. So basically when you buy a digital sewing pattern, it usually comes with at least like three files. One's going to be your instructions. One's going to be a print at home. And one's going to be a copy shop file that you can have printed for you at a place like one of those that I just mentioned. Um, so that is how I like to print them. And my sewing machine is a Bernina B215, I believe. Um, I basically, I used to have a real inexpensive little singer um, that I got. It was probably $99. And um, I used that for quite a long time. And then I, it was challenging. I, you know, it just wasn't a great machine. I also probably wasn't using it properly. I think I've learned a lot more about sewing machines since I got started. So I still have that machine. I've kept it around for my daughter um, or my son, just in case either of my kiddos decide they want to try some sewing. But I went and I took a sewing class at Dry Goods in Seattle. So if anybody is anywhere on the West Coast where they could get to Dry Goods, I absolutely loved taking a class there. And I got to use their machines and I talked to them about it. I was like, okay, if I was going to upgrade my machine, do you have any recommendations? And I believe all of their machines were Bernina's. So I went on eBay and I found a used one for a pretty good price. And it is a dream to sew on. It just is so much easier. I felt like with my old machine that I was fighting it all the time. Or like I was asking too much of it. <laughs> where this machine just runs really, really smoothly. So, um, and then I also use a serger. I use the Baby Lock Imagine, which I love and I highly recommend because it is self-threading. It has this great little uh, pff system where this little puff of air pushes the threads through. So I can change colors on my thread really easy. Um, and I needed that. I was really intimidated by, a, by serging. Um, and it was called an overlocker. And then I had a 
boost by Jessamy, who is an amazing sewist. She actually works at U Fibers. She's on Instagram and she was like, oh, you gotta do it. You just gotta try using it. Um, and it's really helped. I have such limited sewing time. So that has really helped kind of speed up my finishing work because you can finish your edges on there. Um, so those are my machines. Uh, they are definitely investments, but um, I think that they have been worth it. And fabric. So I am very much a novice when it comes to buying fabric. So I don't, I would love to hear in the comments below if anybody has some favorites, um, but I have purchased fabric from Fancy Tiger Crafts and I should write some of these down. So U Fibers, Fancy Tiger, um, Oak Fabrics in Chicago. They have a really beautiful selection. Um, we are the fabric store which I believe, where are they located? New Zealand maybe? But so the shipping can be a bit pricey, um, but they have a great selection. And yeah, and then my local store here in Portland where I live, um, I go to Z Fabrics and they also have an online shop and they are fabulous as well. So there is some places that I buy fabric and i think that was it i think that was all your questions i also somebody did ask me they were new to sewing and they wondered if i had any class recommendations so i don't oh that's not true so see i don't really know of any online sewing classes i mean i know they're out there uh but that's not true because meg McElwee of so liberated more links um so i was going to recommend in general their patterns and they do I think they're even starting to do some sew alongs. She has a mindful wardrobe workshop, and I think they're doing more workshops that are um, also directed at newer sewists. And she does have a craftsy class on sewing mitts. Um, so there are some options for you, but I think that she is, that, that her and her company are a great resource for getting started, and her patterns are. All right, I am a new spinner and I appreciate the information you share regarding your hand spinning. I have a second hand single treadle Scotch Tension Ashford Traveler wheel. When at home, my practice has been to remove the flyer bobbin and remove the band off the drive wheel when I'm done spinning. Other than when I take my wheel somewhere else, I'm wondering if it is okay to just leave everything intact between spins. I feel I would be motivated to spin more frequently if this were the case. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this too. I certainly do not do that myself um, at home. I leave everything intact. The only time I don't is on a wheel that has like those elastic drive bands. So I'll show you what I mean. For instance, this is my travel wheel. This is a Louette Victoria and my drive band, hopefully you can see. Can you see this right here? Boop, boop. So this drive band is stretchy and it goes up here. I have um, three different options here to place it. That is the only thing when I am done spinning, I always take that off because these elasticized drive bands over time can become brittle. And so you don't really want to leave them stretched. You want to let them become as unstretched as possible between spins. So that's the only time that I personally take that down. Otherwise, I'm just looking at my little, um, e-spinner and I'm like oh that's another one I should probably loosen up as I'm not using it <laughs> uh, but otherwise I don't do that I would be curious if other people had any feedback on that um, because it would be good to know so yeah I think that and I'm curious if your Ashford Traveler if it does have um, you know like my Shacked Matchless that just has a cotton um, drive band that I leave, I leave as is, so. All right, well, I think that 
covers all of today's questions, which was so fun. It was fun to kind of hop around to some different topics. I did make my choice. Can you say, oh, sorry, that was so loud. Um, for the DRK Spin It to Knit It Knit Along, you can see my fiber down here. Ooh, I'll hold it up so you can see it closer. So last time I was chatting about what fiber I was gonna use and how I was kind of deciding between three. So this is what I decided on, which I kind of knew, you know, I was working through the other two and there was reasons why I didn't want to use the other two quite yet. So this one, isn't it beautiful? It's so beautiful. So yeah, this is from Hello Yarn. What is it called? Kind of blue. And this one I'm gonna spin for my weekender. So now I just have to decide how I am gonna spin it. I am, I'm not sure. I'm kind of thinking fractal. Um, yeah, decisions are you joining in are you gonna spin with me and how are you gonna spin up your fiber are you spinning undyed fiber are you spinning hand dyed fiber what are you doing solid tonal something like this variegated I would love to hear all about it so let me know and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you here next week have a great day